Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Move the Bites meeting group meeting number eight. It is March 1st, 2023. It's the beginning of March. I don't know about anyone else in this world who thinks in terms of quarters, but as soon as I hear March, I start to freak out about deadlines. And so if you two are freaking out about deadlines, join me. Life is sometimes stressful. But which is for today. Uh, gonna be kind of fun. Uh, last meeting, we had a conversation about a whole bunch of homework that we assigned ourselves. We're gonna talk about that. And then Martin has a wonderful presentation for us today on HCP and LibP2P and how those things might co-mingle. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And then I'm going to talk because you haven't heard me talk enough, clearly. And so we'll uh, we'll see if I can give you some update on some of our numbers uh, after announcing IRO is taking a new direction in the way that we're going to implement IPFS. So first and foremost, uh, we didn't do our homework. And, and by we, I guess... It's me. Uh, in our last meeting, we said we were going to design two documents or put together two documents. One was going to be in a pledge together, the data transfer protocols that we've seen so far into a single Frankenstein of a protocol. And then the other thing we we're going to try to do was gather and enumerate a bunch of use cases to make sure that they were actually connected. Uh, thankfully, there's no teacher in this class. And so we don't get a failing grade or anything. We just, you know, didn't do stuff. But I'm going to take it as a sign because I personally got super busy and like I promised like immediately after the meeting, I'll go make those talks. I'll put them together. And like real on the real, like it's March 1st and I'm stressed out about meeting quarterly deadlines and other stuff. And I'm sure a lot of you are. And so I think hopefully the takeaway we can take on this one is like everyone's super busy. I don't think we need to add more work right now. This can just be our like one hour safe space to present learnings and findings. And, and let's just keep it that way for the next two meetings. Uh, so if I can't find a presenter or if someone doesn't step forward wanting to present something, then we can just fix the meeting. We only have two left uh, scheduled before a big sort of summit uh, planned at IPFS thing, which is coming up on April 15th. If you haven't signed up for IPFS thing, you should totally sign up for IPFS thing. That is where like groups like this really go into hardcore physical meeting mode. But for the time being, I think just keeping this at presentations is totally fine. So hopefully no one was coming to this like stressed out about not having done their homework. Um, let's just give ourselves a pass. Uh, cool. And so with that, Martin, are you ready to chat? Give Martin some time to share screen. But yeah. Um... Okay, do you see my screen? Do you see the presentation? Looks very nice. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, LibP2P and HTTP and how our thinking has evolved there. Um, but first I wanna start with um, um, talking about LibP2P. So what is LibP2P? We start with the raw TCP connection. Um, you've probably heard this before. We use multi-stream to negotiate a security protocol like noise or TLS. And we used multi-stream to negotiate YAMX or MPLEX. Like, nope, this is not what libp2p is. Like, um, this is what libp2p was back when it started in 2015, but today things work differently. So, um, LibP2P, you can basically think of it as a, um, a wrapper around QUIC. Um, I ran some measurements on the IPFS network recently, and 90% of the connections that a node is handling are QUIC connections. And now we have web transport, which is basically QUIC, but usable in the browser. We still do have some, some fallbacks, like the one I, I started with, um, like the, the, uh, the TCP handshake. We still have that because QUIC is not available in, in all networks. There are like five to 10% of networks that, that block QUIC because um, some, some network admins think that everything that you, that's UDP and that's um, not DNS must clearly be part of an, uh, um, an ongoing attack, right? So they drop the packets, so you can't do QUIC. Um, so we need uh, uh, fallbacks like TCP, WebSocket, or WebRTC. But the thing that that um, that LibP2P is focusing on on making making work smoothly, making work um, work fast, uh, is quick. Just because it's the the vast majority of the connections that we are handling. So why would you use um, LibP2P when you already have Quick that gives you um, um, encrypted connections that give you gives you a stream multiplex connections? So I, I see um, the selling point of, of LibP2P um, um, 
there are actually two, two selling points of lib P2P. So the first one is um, lib P2P comes with um, net traversal utilities, um, I call them. And this is um, a whole bunch of stuff that's like, um, it's, it's uh, UPnP um, managing like net port mappings. Um, it's detecting um, if you are behind a net using using AutoNet and then uh, getting uh, getting a subscription with a relay um, to to uh, to allow other nodes to dial you through the net and then to do the whole punching. There's a whole lot of complexity in here. Um, it's 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 really not 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 fun, uh, and it's nice to have a library that uh, that does all this um, all this net traversal for you. Um, the second reason why you would want to use lib P2P instead of just uh, just a raw quick connection is because lib P2P comes with um, with peer-to-peer -peer applications that are pretty um, pretty common for um, for anybody who who is trying to launch a a peer-to-peer -peer network. And uh, these are especially um, a DHT implementation, um, and and this is uh, gossip. So. And there's been a lot of um, like these. These are battle-tested protocols. Um, not to say that they can be improved, especially there's uh, for the DHT. There's a lot of um, a lot of things how you can how you can how you can optimize it. Um, but there's been there's been um, academic research performed on Gossip Sub and the security properties. And if you're trying to launch your own peer-to-peer -peer network, it pro probably makes sense to build on on a, a gossiping uh, implementation and protocol uh, that's been tested and and tr um, that is powering networks like like Ethereum and and Falcon instead of shipping your own thing. And by pulling in lib P2P, you just get the get a gossip sub implementation that uh, pretty much just works. So this is this is kind of how I how I think about um, our our lib P2P stack, um, and we have uh, on the bottom layer on the transport layer it's quick like as I said this is ninety percent we we have all these fallbacks, then on top of this um, we have the net traversal magic which. Obviously, you only need if you are behind a net, uh, and then you have we have the protocols uh, built built on top of this, and um, um, obviously you're not limited to to Kademlia and, and Gossip Sub. You can build your own um, your own protocols that then um, make use of of all this foundation um, that lib P2P gives you. So how do, how does how does HTTP fit in here? Why why do we why are we interested in in um, offering an HTTP option? Um, I think I, I wrote wrote up a document uh, about this um, at the beginning of the working group, and I, I shared it. Um, so I'll keep this short. Um, HTTP is is just universally supported. Like if if you want to do a, a request response protocol, like everybody does does HTTP. Browsers do it. You can do it in in edge workers in the cloud. You can use it from the command line in curl. Like every programming language has an HTTP um, implementation. Um, so it it really opens up um, the use cases. Um, there's a very, very widely deployed uh, caching infrastructure uh, in in the form of CDNs. Um, so if you're if you're offering any HTTP service, it's it's really easy to put uh, like a Cloudflare uh, in front uh, and just have it just cache your requests um, close to the user, um, and it's it's super convenient. And especially since we're dealing with um, uh, with content address data. Um, Making use of that caching infrastructure could actually uh, buy us a lot because content address data, by by its very nature, is infinitely uh, cacheable. Um, another reason why people like HTTP is because um, the request response um, nature of of the protocol um, forces you to write stateless protocols. So every every HTTP request contains all the state that's needed to respond to that HTTP request, um, which makes makes load balancing um, very easy. There's a caveat here, um, and we've we've been running uh, into this a um, couple of times over the years. Um, you need a valid TLS certificate. Um, at for at least some of the clients to be able to establish a connection to you, especially for browsers. 
and while getting a TLS certificate, if, if, if you know your domain and um, uh, then it's, it's pretty easy. You just, just use less encrypt and the ACME protocol, but it turns out it's, it's really hard to just ship a binary like, like Kubo, for example, that just runs everywhere and does the HTTP um, it, it, that gets a TLS certificate for that node uh, all automatically. Um, that's for, for a variety of reasons. That's not that's not really uh, really possible. Um, so getting a TLS certificate is basically only feasible if you if you actually control the deployment of of your nodes. Um, so how how would how would this work um, if we if we had um, a lib P2P and an HTTP? Uh, implementation. Which one would you use? Well, there, so, so there's the, the the idea is to offer the service over over both a plain old HTTPS connection, um, or for improved performance, you would obviously use HTTP three. And we are going almost full circle here because HTTP three again runs on top of Quick. Um, so that's that's the first option that you could do, or you could run um, HTTP on top of a lib P2P stream. So this is this is conceptually very similar to a Hector's um, Go lib P2P HTTP um, repository. If you're familiar with this, um, it's it's a very thin wrapper around a um, uh, around a lib P2P stream. Basically, you you, you negotiate lib P2P uh, you, you negotiate HTTP on top of an H uh, uh, you negotiate HTTP on top of a, a, a lib P2P stream. Um, and then you just serialize your HTTP requests and responses onto that stream. Um, so why would you do this? Um, you would do this because um, you only need to define your, your protocol once. Um, you would define your protocol as, um, as an HTTP, as a set of HTTP handlers. Um, you put them into an HTTP server marks and then you can um, this is obviously using Go terminology here, um, and then you can pass that that um, your your HTTP handlers to your HTTP server and to your lib P2P node, and they will um, they will just serve it via HTTP or via lib P2P. Um, so what you get out of this is well, first of all, it's easy. You just have to define and implement your protocol once, um, and you can run now run HTTP services. Uh, on nodes that are behind NATs and firewalls, and you get all the all the hole punching um, and NAT traversal magic that lib P2P gives you. Um, what about peer IDs? Uh, so I've, we've 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 talked about this um, a bit in the in the lib P2P team, and there's um, nowadays there's something that we would consider that I would consider an an anti pattern basically. It's um, you, you spin up you spin up a usually it's a JS lib P2P node on on a website. Uh, you generate a peer ID. You perform one request. You perform like a few requests. Then you go um, basically user closes the tab and this peer ID is never seen again. Um, why is this an anti pattern? Because well we we probably didn't need that peer ID in the first place. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are use cases for peer IDs. For example, um, in Gossip Sub, um, where you have like a network um, of of long running peers that are passing messages between each other, um, and these peers um, earn a reputation score uh, by by behaving um, behaving in a good way. It totally makes sense to have to have like a cryptographic identifier for every one of those peers, um, but if you're just on a website and you want to to um, download some I don't know some CID and then display it to the user, we don't really need a PID. It doesn't make sense to to force users to generate one. Um, that's why in lib P2P and HTTP we are making um, peer authentication optional. So um, when I when I establish an HTTP connection to a, a lib P2P node, uh, I won't know. I don't have to generate a peer ID myself. And I won't know the peer ID of the server. Um, there are uh, HTTP handlers defined in the specification, so you can authenticate the peer and bas basically um, send it a cryptographic challenge. And like you need to prove um, um, that you have 
that you have knowledge of, of a certain peer ID. So you can do this, but it's, it's, it's optional. And I expect that most applications um, will, not, will not use this. Um, yeah, so um, we have a spec up in the, in the libp2p specs repo. Um, I'd be very happy about, about comments here. Um, yeah, let me know what you think. Martin, this is fantastic. Do we want to take five minutes for questions now? Do folks so? I'm happy to answer questions, yeah. So can my libp2p client node interact with non-libp2p servers? Yeah, that, 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 that would be that would be great. Like I, I want to be able to uh, to just point point people to um to like an S3 bucket. Um, like uh, imagine I'm doing I'm doing like a DHT query. Um, um, doesn't doesn't really really work uh, with with Kademlia today. But just imagine I'm looking up looking up a CID, and instead of just getting a list of peer IDs, um, um, like these peers ha have the content, I would also get like an HTTP multi address, uh, and I could just go to a go to an S3 bucket and and download um, download the the CID. It would be so cool. But but you you end up like missing parts of that, right? Because what's happening is you're, you're turning, like HTTP is being used as a transport here. And when you mm -hmm. fetch data, there's generally some semantics around how that's happening, right? Um, so if you have it and you tell me it's a CID, is it a block? Is it a graph? What is this thing? Um, what do I do with it? Do I want all of it? How, if it's a, if it's a range request, what does that mean for me? Um, like, it feels like there's like a, a second part. It's almost like how currently if you do uh, like a libp2p multi-address doesn't include like fetch using bitswap or fetch using graph sync or whatever. Um, there's like this separate thing that gets figured out with multi with multi-stream or just lives out of band and you know it. Um, I'm not sure if it makes sense to try and cram all of those into the same place or if we need like a tuple here. Um, for, mm -hmm. for what it's worth, the, the uh, IPNI folks have basically turned this into a tuple. Um, there's like the address and then there's the protocol. Um, it's a little heavily tied to peer IDs at the moment, which I've, I've flagged for them as like, we don't want this. We want to be able to do things that don't care about peer IDs. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess just wanted to flag that like you don't necessarily want to assume that HTTP is the terminal part of the protocol. You have to do something else. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can I can pull up one of my my backup slides. Um, how how do I do this? Okay, so here we go. Yeah. Um, so, so, so the, the, the idea is um, that w w so, so when you, when you connect to an, to an HTTP enabled libp 2 p node, um, there's a uh, a predefined URL, um, the the well known libp 2 pjson um, which basically tells you which services are are available on on this node. And uh, in the example here, you have um, you have the two um, the two authentication endpoints um, that we defined that I talked about earlier, and you have you have a Kademlia endpoint. Um, so so there there would probably be a um, um, a, a protocol for 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 like what what we're defining in this working group, a move the bytes protocol, um, and there might be multiple of them. Uh, and then when you when you when you want to, to um, when when you when you have like a, a full a full multi multi address, um, you would need to know which which of those protocols um, you're you're talking to. 
uh, like is this the the move the bytes move the bytes uh, protocol or is this some kind of other uh, data transfer protocol that's um, that's defined by somebody else just like had that slide in your back pocket like oh yeah here's the answer uh, all right i think we have time for one more question everybody else Martin, this is awesome. Much appreciated. I think it's really cool to see, and, and particularly to see your recontextualization of Lipp2P, uh, or I guess a modernization of it. Um, and particularly in how that informs this slide, uh, showing that you can just bring the Lipp2P protocol opt-in, you know, Lego blocks to this just via this well-known Lipp2P.json support heuristic. It's really cool. Thank you. From there, I'm going to take over. Uh, and so, oh, okay. Hold on. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to, so I guess I'm going to talk again. Let's see if I can make this. Can everyone see that? Do you see a slide? Okay, cool. So, yeah. Um, hi. I'm going to talk a little bit about IRO and our 0 0.3.0 release, uh, in particular, the data transfer part of it, because this is the Move the Bytes working group. And so I thought it might be nice to just review some work that we've been doing over the last uh, two months uh, and talk about work we have, like actual code we've shipped to date. We also have some design document work that's happening in parallel, and we're not going to talk about that too much today. Uh, try and focus instead on the stuff that actually shipped and is actually measured, uh, which I think has more bearing on this group. And so. We've been going in a new direction with IRO. We are still an IPFS implementation. We still speak CIDs, but we are asking a lot of funky questions about a lot of existential questions about what, what it means to be an IPFS implementation beyond that. And so to, I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the data transfer protocol. We're gonna talk about how uh, in our effort to build an IPFS-like thing that still uh, speaks CIDs and gets up into an IPFS implementation, we're starting really, really simple. Uh, today, we're not talking about content routing. We don't have any mechanisms for uh, like a deep thing. This is like a really small proof of concept around data transfer um, that is really focused on sending encrypted, uh, uh, encrypted in the sense of encrypted over the wire, so TLS secured verifiable. So we're using some type of checksumming Merkle proofing system um, data over the internet, right? And so we're going to do just really basic. Today, this is like a request response protocol that moves Merkle proof data through a secure connection. Uh, for that, we do have to introduce two new concepts that are in IRO that are distinct from the classic sort of UnixFS DAG-based approach that we see in IPFS today. And so I'm gonna talk really briefly, not briefly actually, this will take a second. Part of this is gonna just be talking about blobs and collections, which are the new primitives that we're working on in IRO. And then we'll talk about how that actually in integrates into the data transfer protocol itself. So blobs, blobs are intended to be invocative, invocative of an object store uh, or a, a blob store, which is we consider, we're actually sort of trying to get away from the notion of a file. This is just blobs of opaque bytes. And that's IRO's primary thing of working in. And so down here we have this, I can't even see my own cursor. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see blob data, which is 50, a 52 kilobyte blob of information. We don't know anything about it. We, you give it to us and we're gonna hold on to it and we're going to content address it. The At the top of this, we have something that should be familiar, which is a root hash, just as a CID that this is the content address of this opaque data. In the middle, we're flipping our hashing algorithm and our chunking algorithm. We're combining those and using Blake3 for both properties. Uh, we're taking the Blake3 uh, hash of a blob, and Blake3 has some really interesting properties in the way that it builds its hashes. Specifically, it uses uh, an internal binary tree structure to construct the hash itself. And the binary tree that is built that builds up to the hash is actually just metadata. In Blake 3, you can throw that away and you don't actually need it, but you can also keep it and use it for verifiable incremental verification of a stream. And so this is analogous to chunking in uh, the traditional uh, world of IPFS, where there are actual chunks in uh, Blake 3. By default, they are one kilobyte in size, which is distinct from the 256 kilobyte default that we often see thrown around. And they are always binary trees. The interesting thing about binary trees in Blake 3 is they are left heavy. Uh, so you're always going to get a ragged right edge to the tree. So in this case, we have a seven 
node thing. The other bit that isn't talked about in the Blake 3 literature that you will discover if you crack open some of the implementations is you can actually modify the chunk size. And so you can play with it and, and sort of use that to your advantage or disadvantage, depending on how you want it to be. And so this is that exact same data chunked using a 32 byte or 16 kilobytes chunk size. The first one was using an eight kilobyte chunk size, which both of which are not standard to the Blake 3 thing. But the thing that's exciting about that is that they're equivalent. If you use a 30, 18, 8 kilobyte chunk size or 16 kilobyte chunk size or a one kilobyte chunk size, you will get the same hash, which is a really, really interesting property. And what makes this kind of throwaway metadata? Uh, that property alone is, is sort of like very dark magic to me. I, I am taking the trust of people who are far smarter than I that that all works. So if you have questions about how that happens, I can't answer that for you in detail right now, but we'll leave it to others to know more. The other primitive that we're introducing are collections. This is uh, just a set that has named links. And so we have names, which are the important thing to note here is it's just a flat list of, hey, we've got stuff separated on the left. The names are all just bytes. So if they are UTF-8 strings to you, that's fine. But uh, in the world of Iro, they are just bytes that label CIDs. And so on the right, you have a CID. On the left, you have names. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. The collection is our only primitive for co-locate, co-locating or collating uh, stuff. It's a flat set. It's not a DAG. You can't put collections inside of collections. Actually, you can. You can do it, but you shouldn't. <laughs> and so, uh, collections are sets, as I mentioned. Uh, and now we're going to talk about how we use those two primitives to actually build a protocol. Uh, so here we have a provider and a getter. This is a request response protocol that is just sending, we have somebody who is making a, a hash available or a CID available, and then someone else is going to get it. Uh, I'm going to quickly try and without a mouse pointer. Okay. So the provider takes the server role and accepts incoming connections. The getter takes a client role and initiates a connection, which can take one or more requests. Each request response uses a separate quick stream. So like on all of this, we are using quick under the hood uh, for the whole. The whole kit and caboodle. Uh, now, the request is the Blake 3 hash of the desired collection of blobs. So I sort of skipped over it when describing collections, but we construct the CID of a collection the exact same way you construct the CID of a blob. It's just take the bytes that are serialized and then run them through the Blake 3 chunking mechanism. And the, the, provider, provider, the, the provider responds by sending the collection metadata as a BOW verified stream. Uh, BOW is a library written in Rust by the one of the authors of the Blake 3 paper. And BOW implements uh, section 6.2 of the Blake 3 paper, which talks about verified streaming. Verified streaming, in short, is all of those chunks that you saw. You can actually keep that metadata around, send the chunks and the incremental ver uh, Merkle proofs for them to know as you are sending the data, uh, you can get incremental verifiability from that. So this protocol is interleaving proofs and the actual data on the wire. And so you're getting, hey, this is the hash of the thing you're about to get. You're going to then grab that chunk, calculate the hash to that chunk. Everything's working great. I'm getting incremental verification based on chunk size through that metadata that is retained inside of our room. Um, yeah, and so the provider sends each blob of collection in the sequence. So it's just going to iterate through the blob list. And so we're just doing uh, whole blob synchronization here. This is really tough to um, actually see what's going on. Give me one second here. Move all of you over here. I don't know if you've had this experience of like sharing on Zoom where I have all of your faces on one side and then I can't actually see anything. Okay, anyways, so we have whole collection replication. That's all we're doing. And now let's look at some numbers around how we did with that. And so keep in mind with, or not even that, let's talk about throughput. Uh, here for these numbers, we did a one gigabit per second link. So we have this whole thing capped. We're doing 5.5% uh, packet loss and 20 millisecond latency. And so we're simulating all of that just to get a, general sense of like how things are going on a one gigabit connection. In this case, we have a single provider and a single getter on the top. We've got Iro producing, you know, coming in at 0.65 gigs per second. And a raw HTTP connection is almost is able to almost completely saturate the connection at point, I can actually see the number, 0.96. And then uh, the on the bottom, we have just that exact same scenario, but now we have 10 getters getting the exact same content from a single provider. And here you can see a, a sort of like 2.23 gigabits per second. The max here at the bottom is now actually the total sum of the connections. So that should actually be 10 gigabits per second. And you can see that HTTP can really naturally saturate that. 
HTTPS has a big drop. And I think this is one of the themes that showed up for us in this early analysis. HTTPS actually costs you more than you'd think. And, and we're really sort of surprised by how much, like, obviously we're, we're in no way against the idea of having TLS, it's crucial, but uh, there is there is an overhead to be paid in terms of uh, having TLS support. And then obviously for us, we what we're excited about from these numbers is this like one-to-one -one getter we're getting within striking distance of HTTP TLS. And the thing that's exciting here is Iro is doing the additional work of Merkle verification, right? So you're actually getting, hey, all over the wire, we're incrementally verifying that that data coming back to you is the data that was promised by the CID that you asked for. Uh, moving on. Uh, yeah, so we have some constraints on the provider side that we need to look at, but we then sort of said, okay, what, what, how can we examine those constraints and how can we better understand where the bottleneck is? And uh, Asmir on our team ran a thread per core experiment. And this, I apologize if you're not like widely into uh, proselytizing about Rust runtimes, but um, this is the, a thing that Rust engineers love to do. We did a experiment where we took the Tokyo runtime and matched it to a single thread per core and said, okay, let's try and see if that's actually the bottleneck, if the runtime gives us any advantage. And it turns out in this world, we could get one provider, one getter to actually be faster than HTTPS while including Merkle verification. And so for me, this was like, you know, I was running, screaming through my own apartment saying, yeah, yeah, we're beating curl. Uh, it's just to like illustrate what HTTPS is happening there. It's an HTTPS server and then just curling that endpoint for the exact same data that you would be getting via IRO. And then on the one provider 10 getter side, we're also seeing that that uh, provider side constraint is not only going away, but we're now starting to beat HTTPS there as well, which is neat. But for this trick to work, for thread per core to function, uh, you need SO reuse port, which is a uh, kernel level instruction that allows you to have multiple, uh, to redirect from a single UDP socket uh, on your incoming connections. That is not, that is available on Linux, that is not available on all platforms. IRO has to target 12 platforms. So yay, we figured out that there's a runtime constraint, but the answer to that may not be as clear cut as just like do thread per core. But if you're in Linux world, you know, we can, we have shown, uh, demonstrably shown that we can actually beat HTTPS and do verification, which I'm like super fired up about. That's not the thing that we shipped. The thing that we shipped, the numbers look more like this. Uh, the, yeah, so next up um, is, okay, cool. That's, that's all locked at a gigabit per second max bandwidth connection. What about if we go faster? So here, we're just trying to understand max throughput. And so this is a 67 gigabits per second link, which is like not really real, I guess, unless you're in some sort of data center, but this was like all being run locally. Uh, we The 67 gigabits per second throughput number is coming from an iperf measurement. And then here again, you can see that HTTP is able to get to 27 gigabits per second when, through, when basically uncapped. iperf UDP, so just doing UDP sockets is giving us something like 5.6, which is interesting for us because we're doing UDP based protocols. But then I think the thing that's really wild to call out here is again, that HTTPS to HTTP jump, right? Like here you, you'll often use a 10 gigabit per second connection as a sort of like hallmark of like, can you saturate 10 gigs? Our tests show that like HTTPS has trouble saturating 10 gigs. And so even and, and the Trump, the jump just from transport layer security is like a really meaningful jump. And it's actually bigger than the jump from HTTPS down to IRO, which is, at sitting at 1.8 gigabit per second throughput, which is not great, right? We're capped at, uh, at around 1.8 gigs per second in terms of throughput. And we need to understand why that is and, and how to improve that. But I think the thing that sort of really excited me about this was like, okay, cool. We can do a gig a second, great. We definitely can't do 10, but also we've learned a lot about what TLS does to this like, these like sort of bonkers, hey, can I do 10 gigabit per second links? And that sort of brings us to the, sort of fundamental conclusion that TLS comes to cost, which again, should be paid. We're in peer-to-peer -peer systems, but it, it's, a, it's a helpful orienting uh, number. And, but also like, why aren't we just going back and using HTTPS, which is going to give you 5.7 gigs a second and like use that in our thing. <laughs> why are we using quick? Uh, we're really, the thing that we want to sort of call attention here is while we're showing you numbers that are all measuring throughput, 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 the thing that we're actually optimizing for is latency, right? Where it's a peer-to-peer -peer system and latency is the thing that we think we need to really solve for in a meaningful way. And so we're betting on quick in a hard way because we think that a lack of head of line blocking and uh, the, a much more latency optimized uh, protocol is gonna win out in the end. 
even if HTTP is the more mature thoroughbred of the of the networking stack, uh, we think that over time, as we start to uh, add more and more sophisticated measurements to this protocol, we will better understand that quick is the right bet. I think that's just a nice place to stop where it's like, these numbers are great or they're, they're like fun to show and, and be like, cool, we've, we've worked really hard to get into a position where we can now run these simulations at every single commit and meaningfully simulate and tune packet loss and latency that has taken Asmir on our teams just like so much time. Uh, but the at the end of the day, like understanding how this thing is going to perform in the wild is still, you still have to take all of this with a grain of salt, right? And so that's worth uh, sort of mentioning. It is also worth bringing up that we have actually been running this test and we've had folks report through their initial use of, of the new IRO locally that they're getting roughly the same numbers back. And so it's nice to see that that kind of coming through. But yeah, that's what we've got so far. I will stop sharing and leave time for questions. Uh, oh no, I've got a question. Else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, throughout the, the course of this group, we've talked a lot about like, comparing to BitSwap and, you know, overcoming that is the uh, status quo and BitSwap wasn't in your presentation at all, which is totally fine, but curious, like, is the motivation here with the new data transfer protocol to really like match or beat HTTP? I think you referred to that a little bit, maybe in your post on Slack about trying to appeal to Web2 developers. So I was wondering if you could, you know, expound on yeah. that. Yeah, that's a really good point. We, I, I would, there's nothing that would make me happier than to like expand the number of protocols we're actually testing against. Um, it is really it's a it's a real time investment to add to our net to our test suite like another a protocol. I I would love to do it at some point. It'll probably be anecdotal at first, um, in the sense of like just do a, a one off and see at a specific release commit how we can how we stack up against BitSwap. Um, it's, so the answer is I'm not sure. We haven't measured it because it's hard to add another protocol to measure. Uh, but the the reason why you're seeing HTTP, HTTPS, you know, this is that for us is the benchmark, right? Like how close can we get to what is widely considered the stock standard for throughput, the stock standard for latency. We're not as interested in like, you know, <laughs> having conversations about, oh, well, our, we're, we're like 5% faster than this thing. Well, we've all come to agree. Like this part of the formation of this working group was we were going to try to make an improvement on the bit swap status quo. And so ideally that just helps orient all of our figures. Martin. Can't hear you. Oh no. Uh, to answer your quiet question, Marco, while Martin's figuring out his audio, I can't hear you, Martin. Just jump in. Uh, we're not using jumbo frames. Uh, oh no, I was talking with yeah. um, Dignified Choir about. Oh yeah. Uh, like I think that's kind of cheating because I think if you send jumbo frames in real networks, they're going to yeah. Be yeah, we can't, we can't, we can't do that outside of data centers. And so we don't, yeah. with the too much. <laughs> well, we can't, we might not be able to do that outside of data centers, but yeah, we can do inside of data centers, which means you at least get good throughput in the case, in those cases, which is a meaningful Can, can you actually like, do it within data centers? Well, I mean, Sometimes if you control the, if you control the network stack, it's, it's as far as I understand it. Uh, it's relatively but, but like if you're in like AWS, you don't control like the routers. Oh, I, I AWS is not data center. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Not, so if you like, oh, no, I, it. I don't control that, right? Like, if I talk about data centers like Google running their data center, like they can do that. Um, okay, a I box see. in AWS for me is not running a data center, that's just some random machine on the internet that I have zero control <laughs> over the actual networking <laughs> there. Welcome to the chat, Dig. Uh, Martin, is, does your audio work? And then we'll go to Adin. No, oh, I can't hear you. Dang. Oh. We've got a great view now, but we can't hear you. And so it's... <laughs> it's either view or audio. Yeah. No, still. Martin, just stand muted. And if you can interrupt us, interrupt us. Adin, what's going on? Um, yeah. I guess I wanted to follow up. I think Mark got a question in the chat, which is like, what's the, what advantages are you getting or hoping to get from using like quick over HTTP three when you're, it seems like you're just doing request response. Hey, you're here. Do you want to take it? 
I have an answer. Um, Quick versus HTTP three. To be honest, um, I uh, have not done a deep evaluation of Quick versus HTTP three. Um, I've so far um, the simple answer to that is um, I have like the actual deployments and code that I've worked with were like I get Quick. Like I, I don't need HTTP three uh, overheads. I don't need the stuff in there. Um, I do need a, the ability eventually. I know I have some. I have some stuff where I want to be able to send datagrams directly. Um, I have some stuff, um, uh, like a lot of code that I'm writing right now, is replacing the underlying UDP socket um, uh, on the fly. So I need anything what I work with, which is one of the reasons we can't actually use S2 and Quick. Unfortunately, we have to use Quinn uh, for anybody who's into Rust libraries and Quick um, because they actually allow you to abstract over the UDP socket and not just like require you to have the physical socket in quotes. Um, HTTP three might be a real option eventually. Um, but I, 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 for me, the long-term solution is, uh, less, less things that were designed for the web, for web two quote unquote, because it is mostly a different target um and not more um but there's a lot of worlds where http in your op obviously has a lot of benefits um so this is not a decision against http3 it is a decision mostly against uh hp2 uh and lower shall we try this again can you hear me yes brilliant oh, what's up yes. I, I love zoom um, so, um, a few thoughts on, on the measurement. So when you say HTTP, HTTP and HTTPS, you probably want to specify if that's HTTP one or HTTP two or HTTP three, um, um, which would again be quick. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, second thing, um, don't apply random packet loss. Like the 0.5% the packet loss doesn't really make sense in the measurement because packet loss is not stochastic in a network. Packet loss happens when, when queues fill up uh, and then are taken as, a, as an input for your congestion controller. Um, like stochastic packet loss just doesn't happen on, on real networks. Um, um, then, then regarding quick stacks, um, yeah, I'm also also worried about uh, how much how much of this is benchmarking Quinn versus um, C, a, a benchmarking the actual protocol that you're using. Um, you could try to to use MS Quick. Uh, they've done um, uh, Microsoft has done amazing work of like really getting their their Quick stack um, up to speed and to to gigabit speeds. So if you're interested in that in that kind of performance range, uh, definitely try to to link in uh, uh, MS Quick. Um, then regarding HTTP three versus Quick, so HTTP three is basically just a, um, a just a thin wrapper around Quick. So I wouldn't expect any any performance hit uh, from HTTP uh, there. Um, I'm not sure when you when you talk about uh, sending datagrams. The, uh, are you talking about UDP datagrams or are you talking about um, Quick datagram frames? uh well in 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 my my ideal net world i can i mean i can always always send raw udp datagrams because i will like whatever i use it will have a distraction to like just push stuff into the udp socket um i need that for other things um for on the protocol level i was i was referring to the the, the ability that quick exposes of actually sending um, datagrams, uh, not unreliable datagrams, yeah, over the same connection. Yeah, good. Quick, quick datagrams are, are pretty cool, and and they come uh, like the, the main benefit you get from them is they are congestion controlled. Um, they are replay safe because they are just encrypted as the rest of the um, of the uh, of the quick connection, and they are also available in HTTP three. There's also an, a, a datagram extension in HTTP three that builds on top of datagrams in, in Quake, so uh, shouldn't be an argument against uh, H3. 
Yeah, and then and Martin, while we have you, that's a carve out for web transport, isn't it? Like, isn't web transport leveraging that to provide unreliable streams? Uh, web transport is using everything. It's using uni yeah. and binary code streams and and datagrams. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I'm so glad you joined the call today, Mark. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Uh, no. What's the actual state of HGP3? I've been out of the web world for a while, so I haven't followed too much. Like, wh where is that? Like, the st the mo a lot of the stack, like actual implementation stacks that I've seen, are still all like, yeah, we. Like there's work in progress for HTTP three, but like what what's the state of like servers and browsers for HTTP three these days? Anybody know? I think thirty percent. Well, the latest numbers I have is from from the HTTP workshop, which was around uh, October last year, and I think uh, thirty percent of the internet traffic is now quick, um, which means, and, and probably all of it, um, most of it is HTTP three. Cool, that's more than I expected. How's IPv6 going? Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Daniel, and then I think that we'll, we'll close it after Daniel's question. Yeah, I'm curious um, if in, I can't remember from the slides, but are you also investigating the use case of multiple providers and multiple consumers? Or is that even like an area of exploration that is important for you? Super important for us. Uh, we'll be discussing that in the design doc stuff. We definitely, I, I'm of the strong opinion that we need to get to multi-providers and I deeply agree with um, Chiropo's approach of making smarter clients. I think that having clients be able to coordinate request parallelism across peers is dope AF and the way that we should do it. But uh, that's a design discussion that we're like sort of midway through. But I, I think you can imagine a paradigm of request response utilized to establish parallelism across things like collections is the sort of general rough outline cool thanks everybody for joining um it, the i will i may be going on leave in two weeks high chance we'll cancel the call for two weeks but if we don't and if someone has wants to take on the responsibility of running this call please dm me i would love it if we still had this call in two weeks but if not, uh, I will see all of you in a month. If you have an idea, if you have something you want to talk about, like Martin's talk came out of the fact that Martin and I talked yesterday and I said, Martin, can you come tell me the great things that you just told me? Uh, so if you have thoughts percolating, please come talk to me. Uh, this is a safe space to talk nerd. But beyond that, thank you so much everybody for joining. All right, have a good one. Thank you.